Let the meltdown begin. MMA meltdown on the Fight Network. I am Gabriel Morenci. Let's do this thing. Daily double style as we're going to go to hell and back with Vince Pichel. Vince Pichel coming off a very, very impressive victory at the UFC 173. He's also coming off a, a fractured orbital bone surgery. And uh, he's going to join us nevertheless. And uh, we had Vince on a couple of weeks before his big fight. Now we got him on after the fight. Uh, Joey Odessa. It's going to break down a ton of fights. We got not one, but two. That's right, not one, but two UFC cards uh, this Saturday. One in Brazil and one in Germany, although the German one's a little bit better than the Brazilian one. The Brazilian one is the Ultimate Fighter TV show, um, and uh, it's a bunch of Brazilian dudes that people don't know a whole hell of a lot about, but the German card is uh, pretty good stuff. You know what else is pretty good stuff? Uh, cashing a TJ Dillashaw, Dillashaw taking it plus six plus 700. I was not one of them. I didn't see it happening. I didn't see it happening. Despite all the warning signs, I did not see it happening. You know, we're seeing this on a weekly basis right now. Nobody thought that Michael Chandler was going to lose, even though he really won the fight. Well, he, technically he lost uh, the fight. You know, we go back at uh, the UFC the week before. Matt Brown cashed a ticket as a big underdog. Eddie Wineland losing at minus 500. We're seeing it time and time again. You can assume nothing in the world of mixed martial arts and even in the UFC, no favorite and no champion is unbeatable. We're gonna break it all down and more. We got some great videos in a week. MMA Meltdown continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Let's go to hell and back, or at least I hope we make it back uh, from our trip into the depths of uh, hell. And uh, Vince uh, Pichel should have like a slayer uh, as his intro song. But as long as he uh, keeps winning fights, it's all good as we welcome uh, Vince Pichel back to MMA Meltdown. Vince, it's always a pleasure, man. How you doing? Good, man. I'm doing good. How you doing? Hey, we're doing good, uh, Vince. Uh, first off, congratulations uh, on the win, man. We had you on the program a couple of weeks before the fight. It was great to see you. Everything that you talked about on this show, you executed. It has to feel damn good to execute the game plan. Yep. Um, like I said, man, Andrew Corning was a puzzle, and we figured him out. And, you know, what you saw on uh, Saturday night was, was the puzzle being put together. Now, um, you know, the fight wasn't, uh, you know, you didn't get out of it unscathed. And, you know, you posted the picture on Instagram of your orbital bone. Now, you're pretty hardcore, man. I really appreciate you joining us uh, just a couple of days after this fight. So what's the deal? You had to get some uh, some surgery done? Yeah, I had to get surgery that night. Um, in the beginning of the first round in the exchange where I accidentally poked his eye, uh, that's where I suffered the fractured orbital. And the whole rest of the fight, I mean, I was fighting three of them. So uh, I, I kind of just pushed through and, and, and did what I had to do to come out with the, with the win. Uh, but it was definitely tough and a little tricky, but I made some adjustments and, and I pulled through. So you're saying you're seeing three of them. So is that, what, what's it like at that point? Everything all blurry and you're, see, you're literally seeing like multiple Nokajanis out there, man. It must have been freaky. Yeah, it was, it was a, little, uh, a little distracting, um, a, little, a little worrisome, but... Uh, when I was throwing combos or when I, when I could feel him like he was going to come at me, um, I kind of just closed one eye and, and focused on him, on the one that was there, and then, and then went for it. Um, but but like, he, like I said before, he, he's pretty predictable, and, and it wasn't too bad for me. Um, now that I think about it, it's kind of crazy that I fought him like the whole time like that, you know, and, and especially as good as I fought him. But, you know, I did what I had to do. Man, you just, you fought angry. You fought angry. And, and listen, I'm not a coach, uh, but, you know, watching the sport as long as I have, I look at the guys that fight angry and don't give their opponent a, a second, just relentless. And, and he said it after. He, you know, he said, man, he was just relentless uh, on me from the onset. Uh, you know, how do you match that? Because it's hard, I guess, as much cardio work and as much work you can put in the gym, you can't match the intensity and the ferocity of what's going on in a real fight in the octagon, right, Vince? But, man, you, you know, you brought it, man. Like, have you ever felt that strong before in a fight? Um, honestly, I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't really explain how I fight like that. I, I do fight a little angry, 
Um, but when I'm in there, it's it's kind of just adrenaline takes over, and, and you get moments where you do get tired and, and you're kind of slacking for a second, but I kind of get that quick little adrenaline boost. But I was honestly kind of pissed off by him because I felt like he was being a little bitch during the fight. Like, I mean, I, I gouged him. I mean, yeah, I, I got him there. You know, I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from that. Did I gouge him? Um, and the nut shot, I mean, I grazed this cup. It wasn't like a solid shot to the nut, which, you know, I understand him kind of whining about that too. But after that, the whole fight, it kind of seemed like he was trying to make a big deal about it. You know, like to me, it seemed like he was trying to find excuses to not fight where I was trying to find make excuses to win the fight. Yeah, and he said after the fight, I'm not making excuses, but, and then, of course, the excuse came, right? And, you know, yeah. I think... As I'll you make excuses, but this is my excuse. It's yeah, exactly. Kind of <laughs> and, you know, listen, the eye pokes are going to happen, man. I don't know if it's about the gloves. That, that stuff's going to happen. It was incidental. We know that. And it seems like when guys sort of get grazed in the nuts... They're looking for the sympathy from the judges as well, or everybody in the building almost. Like, oh, what happened to me? It's like, hey, it is what it is. You got five minutes to suck it up. The only thing I don't like, Vince, is when I see referees telling guys to hurry up. When a guy's got five minutes, he's got five minutes, right? Yeah, and they're trying to push it, push the play, because, you know, the crowd starts booing or they're getting antsy. But it's like, who gives a shit about the crowd, man? They're not the ones when they're fighting. No, exactly. They're not the ones going to the hospital or, you know, they're not the ones going back home all beat up after the fact. Now, I got to be honest with you here, Vince. Uh, I, I bet on you, so I guess I owe you a drink uh, you know, sometime in Vegas. You were an underdog. Oh, you were an underdog in this fight. You were a plus 200 underdog, and I didn't under, really understand why. And when I talked to you, I believed what you said. I, I know Anthony's all flashy and the spinning back fist and the kicks and all that, but I thought that you could wear him out and bully him a little bit, and you did. But I got to be honest, if I bet on every fighter that came on the program, I'd go broke. But, man, you, you, kicked, <laughs> ass, you kicked ass and got it done. Were you aware that you were a two-to-one underdog in the fight? Uh, no, not until actually the, I saw the, the fight afterwards. That's when I saw the actual odds because I don't really pay attention to stuff like that because it's a fight and it's MMA, and, you know, there's always going to be an underdog and there's always going to be a favorite. And I don't, I don't worry about that stuff. I just worry about figuring the guy out and, and making the game plan to go to work. So when you rewatch the fight, I guess, so yeah, you see the odds, right? When they, uh, that's, that's pretty yeah. cool. Here, we watch it, rewatching a fight. Uh, is it strange when you rewatch a fight? Cause I speak to a lot of fighters that say, honestly, they don't really remember everything. They need to watch it to remember what happened. It's sort of a blur. Yeah. It's the same with me. I remember, uh, I remember bits and pieces like I remember, I remember the eye poke. I remember uh, I grazed him in the nuts. I remember him thinking he hit me in the nuts and trying to stop the fight. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. I remember him grabbing my gloves, like just dirty little shit like that, and uh, just just things like that. But when I I rewatch it, that's when I I put everything together. I'm like, okay, that's what happened. That's what happened there. And that's just kind of like time and space doesn't really like exist in that in that amount of time that you're in there actually fighting. It's just it happens. Now, you posted, uh, you posted a picture on Instagram, and you also stated to all you paper stat pushers that doubted me, who are you talking to uh, right there? I'm glad I'm not one of them, and I got the proof. I, post, <laughs> I posted my pick, Vince, on the Internet, so it's documented. I took you. So who, who are you talking to about the paper stat pushers? I, I've been getting messages. I've been getting tweets about how I'm, I'm the underdog and I have no chance, and then everyone's comments like, Oh, I like Michelle, but there's no way he's going to be Enjikwani and this and that. And just, just basically everyone that, that's a hater and a doubter. Like, if there's actually one guy that, that posted the, uh, the odds on, on my page that did a detailed report that was actually really smart. And, um, I'll tag you in it so you could read the report. But that guy, that guy knew what he was talking about. He's actually a smart veteran. And the report that he wrote on me and Enjikwani, um, was, was actually very intelligent and I enjoyed reading it. And, you know, that guy, that guy knew what he was talking about. But then, you know, you get everyone else that's like, you know, he's good. But this guy's such a veteran. There's no way you could beat him. He's just going to get comfortable standing. And, you know, he's just going to pick you apart and this and that. And, yeah, honestly, if I would have if I would have sat there and, and not threatened to take down and not even tried to take him down and sat there and just kickboxed him, yeah, he probably would have pitched me apart. But I wasn't going to let that happen, you know. And that's not my style. I'm not the kind of guy that sits there and sits back and, and trades punch for punch. You know, I'm going to get in your face. I'm going to throw at you and, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna make you I'm gonna make you remember that fight, the fight with me. Yeah, I enjoy uh, SureDog.com. I think it's a great website. Uh, but it's funny that you bring this up because I vividly remember uh, the 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 preview and prediction for your fight, in which they said uh, Pichelle is good, but he doesn't have the wrestling to contain Anthony for 15 minutes. So I guess it, <laughs> I guess you you like proving everyone wrong out there, huh? <laughs> Yeah, I do. And, and you know what? You know what I have to thank for that is uh, Rustin Kabalov. After that fight, I've been working a lot on my wrestling. Um, my wrestling was basically my weakest link in my in my, uh, my MMA triangle, whether, you know, kickboxing, jiu-jitsu, and wrestling. And after that fight, um, it kind of opened my eyes, so I've been working a lot of my wrestling. And, and I'll, I'm super comfortable now, like, taking shots. I never took shots before. You know, I took a couple shots in the fight. Um, you know, I was grabbing stuff. I was always the kind of guy that if I got a hold of it, I'd pick you up and slam you down, but... Now I'm doing it with a little more technique, and, and I'm learning a little more wrestling. So, you know, like I said, I, I have no one to thank for Rustin Kabloff for, for beating me the way he did because that honestly lit a fire into my ass and, and got me motivated to learn it and, you know, yeah. work on my weak point. And that's what's hard for a fighter is to get better at what you're not good at. And, you know, it, it's, it's been a hard challenge for me, but uh, I'm overcoming it. And I guess as well, right? I mean, before you were in the UFC, as you stated, you, you were handed your first loss there. If you're beating people up, you don't really, you're not getting better, right? I mean, it looks cool and it's great, you know, and, you know, it's great when you're taking a winning picture, but if you're knocking the crap out of people and, you know, the competition isn't there, you don't really, you're not really going to improve from a fight to fight basis. And in the UFC, there are no easy fights, right? So you're know, just jumping leaps and bounds with each camp, I imagine. Exactly, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, like you said, with, with every fight I've won, I didn't really learn much besides. Like, you know, yeah, I kicked that guy's ass or, or I, I could take him easily. You know, if he wants to fight, you get off out him again. Like, that's basically all you take away from a win, you know. And, and that, on, on top of, like, just the, the emotional feeling of, of having your hands raised. I mean, there's there's very rare feelings in the world that can, that can mimic that feeling you get when your hand gets raised after a fight. Um, um, but, yeah, after my loss, I learned a lot, and, and I changed a lot of my game, and, and that's what you saw on Saturday. Um, you know, um, every time I read an interview with you, and I didn't ask you about this when we had you on the show, because I figured, you know, you, you've been asked about it so much, but, uh, you know, working for AAA, I imagine at some point in time, man, you know, you, you're fighting full-time in the UFC. Is, is, is uh, you know, AAA going to take a back seat here? Um, hopefully soon. Uh, by, uh, you know, maybe if I get, get myself a good bonus, um, it, it'll allow me to, to go back to work on the weekends or, or even quit my job at AAA. But for now, I mean, I live in California, so there's there's really no easy route in life. So I got to do what I got to do, and, and I'm going to continue to do what I got to do. Uh, where do you see yourself uh, right now in the grand schemes uh, of things in the UFC? Do you feel like you can uh, make some noise right now? You got a little momentum going? Yeah, I feel like, I feel like I'm starting to steamroll right now. And, um, you know, I try to let my eye heal up, go back to training, and... and Plan, plan the next move for myself uh, and see how that goes. You know, it's it's UFC, so it's, it's not going to be an easy route, but I, got, I just got to take it one fight at a time because you, you can't overlook anyone in the UFC. They're all here for a reason. Uh, Vince uh, Pichel uh, with us. And uh, Vince, before we let you go, man, Amanda, uh, Amanda Early, uh, who helps us uh, hook up uh, with all these great fighters, told me, you know, speak slowly. You know, he just had surgery and stuff. Uh, but man, you, you're you're flying. I thought you were going to be all morphined out. I was hoping for it, Vince. I I even told the guys here. I said, you know, he just had surgery. He might be all pop hopped up on morphine or something. Could be, you know, real fun to have him on. But you sound you sound yeah. you sound lucid. You sound great. Yeah, I've been a little jacked up on Percocets and some anti nausea pills in the last few days, but I'm doing all right. I'm not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> See, those are the perks. The perks are winning. <laughs> right there, yep, yep. <laughs> li li literally and figuratively, the perks, uh, the perks of victory in the UFC octagon. Well, hey Vince, it was great to have you on the show again. I love talking to fighters before the fight and then after the fight. Congratulations on executing the game plan. You look great doing it, and uh, you know, one by one, with 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 uh, each win and each fight, you're gonna have less doubters out there and less people are picking against you. Except, I like it, man. Plus two hundred as an underdog. I like it when people doubt you, Vince, but uh, you're the man, and uh, congratulations again, bro. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I made some, I made some people some serious money, and I lost some people some serious money. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure, Vince.
All right, thanks for having me, Gabe. Have a good one. There's uh, Vince Pichel. We went to hell and back and survived with Vince Pichel. He sounded good, though. Like I said, I was kind of hoping he was going to be all hopped up and, uh, and you know, say some crazy stuff, although he did call uh, – he did call Noka Jani a bitch uh, after the fact and said, hey, stop bitching. But that's the thing with a guy like Vince Pichel. He grew up, man, tough. Like, Vince grew up fighting on the streets and stuff. You get in the octagon with this guy, it's going to be a fight. And he got slammed around in his first fight, so he's kind of forgotten about. But uh, I tell you what, man, if I'm a fighter, I don't want to get a piece of, uh, piece of Vince Pichel because this guy's bringing it. And uh, he's just got that it, psychotic fight-type uh, mentality in him that you can't teach. Great stuff uh, with Vince uh, Pichel. We're going to crunch some numbers. we got some wild videos uh, of the week, including Flay Floyd Mayweather's dust-up in Las Vegas, Nevada at Fat Burger. So, you know, Fat Burger, uh, the calorie is not the only dangerous thing in Fat Burger, evidently. And I don't think you want to mess with T.I., but uh, we'll get to all that and more. MMA Meltdown continues. Thanks to Vince Pichel for uh, joining us. And once again, congratulations on his big win this past uh, Saturday night. Now, there was a lot of chaos uh, over the weekend, and there were a lot of fights in and outside of the octagons and rings of the world. And, you know, Floyd Mayweather, you know, the greatest boxer in the world, uh, one of the richest uh, athletes in the world, the guy's making a reported $70 million a fight uh, right now, basically 40 to show up and another 40 as far as pay-per-views are concerned. And, you know, <laughs> Hen and Burrell is getting 40000 to show up. Floyd Mayweather is getting $40 million to show up. But listen, I'm not going to, you know, give Floyd Mayweather a lot of advice. But if I've got, like, $350 million and I'm making $72 million a fight, I'm probably not going to be arguing with rappers who have done jail time for having a freaking arsenal uh, you know, locked and loaded and ready to go as Floyd Mayweather got into it with T.I. Now, I'm an old white guy. I don't look old, but I am 43. Uh, the hair's gone because of all the gambling. But I'm going to profess to being the old, uh, dumb white guy here. I don't really know much about T.I. besides the fact that, you know, he might shoot you. So this is uh, what we got here. Floyd Mayweather and T.I. at a fat burger. This is when I'm heading for the exits, because this is when the bullets start flying. The way we are here, Just go, just go. You control your bitch, Now, from what I understand, this isn't over yet. Um, there's been some, like, shootings and stuff like that, and some of Floyd's guys might have been shot at by some of T.I.'s people. And, uh, you know, like I said, this, this, is a, this is a game that's just ridiculously stupid uh, to play if you're Floyd Mayweather. Who cares about T.I.? He's just another dumb rapper. But if you're Floyd Mayweather, you got too much money at stake to be screwing around with some freaking rapper at Fat Burger at 2 in the morning uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, but, you know, <laughs> Boyd Mayweather can do whatever the hell he wants to do. Now, let's get to this next uh, video. It's been, uh, it's been a few weeks since we've had a nice, nasty, old-school injury. Let's, let's watch somebody get hurt. That's not us. Ooh, you got... Oh, mm. God. Those kids' legs didn't look, you know, they look pretty skinny to begin with, man. Like, uh, that's pretty bad. Uh, that's uh, <laughs> not the worst injury we've ever shown on the program, but uh, a pretty bad one nevertheless. All right, let's get to, uh, you know, we showed the Floyd Mayweather video. I'll be honest with you. It sucked, all right? Nobody got shot at. Nobody got hit with anything. You know, it's a bunch of rich dudes, you know, yelling at each other, whatever. But... It's, it was pertinent. It's in the news. It's, it's a fight video. 
just like this video. A lot of people are talking about uh, what happened uh, here with this dude. This is an amateur fight. Dude's beating the crap out of the other dude. And uh, you'll see what happens here. He taps out. Laying a real beating on him. Referee's not going to stop it. No one's throwing the towel in. If I was the dude that, uh, if I was the dude that was getting my ass kicked and I won like that, I'd still be like, yeah, screw you, man. Start talking smack to everybody after the fact. But, you know, I guess that was a nice act of sportsmanship. It's a good thing, like, you know, Le Le uh, Leota Machida's father is at this kid's trainer because he'd slap him around after for disgracing the family. In our family, we win. But the dude that tapped out actually said after, it's an amateur fight. Doesn't count as far as our record is concerned. He goes, I don't care about the win or the loss. I know who won the fight. And he said, you know, nobody was going to stop it. So uh, I stopped it. So it was a classy gesture, but kind of patronizing to the other guy. And it's almost to the point there. Like, I don't care that the other guy tapped out. Did he really lose the fight? No. But uh, you know, there's our little Disney moment. I guess Disney's going to make an MMA movie and... You know, oh, and he tapped out, and now they're the best of friends. You know, actually, now that I've, this video has sunk in, it just angers me. It's a freaking fight, man. You, you don't tap out. You, you don't tap out for the other guy. If you feel bad for him, knock him out and end the fight, man. People are going to, to, the, to, to some bar to see this uh, stuff for a kumbaya moment, all right? If I want to watch people hug each other, I'll go to a strip club. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. <music> MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. Let's send it to Costa Rica, where the premier combat sport odds maker in the business, Joey Odessa, steps up and in. Joey, it's always a pleasure. How you doing? Doing good. What's happening, Jake? We're doing all right, uh, Joey. We're broadcasting in the middle of a monsoon uh, right now. Uh, big, uh, big uh, rainstorms going on outside here. I'm surprised the microphone's not picking up the rain on the roof. Uh, you know, I expect, uh, I expect inclement weather conditions from you in Costa Rica, but it's us in Toronto this week. Uh, these weather forecasters are as good as these MMA, MMA touts. They're all in the same category. Flip a coin. Uh, but it's actually pretty nice out for the rainy season right now. Nice and sunny out today. All right. Uh, so, uh, Joey, a ton of stuff uh, to get to here. First things first, you were pretty adamant, man, that T.J. Dillashaw was going to beat Henan Burrell. Well, not as convinced as you have been in, in the past, but you brought it up. You brought it up on the radio show. You brought it up on this show. You like Dillashaw or you didn't like Burrell so much. It uh, turns out Burrell, you know, what he was he was trying to cut like you know upwards of 40 plus pounds, all kinds of crazy talk about extreme weight cuts. And something interesting that you brought up last week, Joey, was his forty thousand dollar stuff, the fact that he was unhappy with the amount of money that he was making. And you brought up the old biorhythm uh with, with Hen and Burrell. And not to take anything away from what Dillashaw did, because he fought a perfect fight, but that didn't look like Hannon Burrell in there, did it? Like, that, you know, it, it just, it was like his body was there. It was him, but the fighting spirit wasn't there, Joey. The emotional maturity. I think he was, you know, I think he was a little overwhelmed at the fact that he was, in such a short period of time, named as the number one pound per pound fighter in the world, and then somebody got in his ear and told him he wasn't making that much money, and he, he dwelled on it. And I think it affected him in the fight. And meanwhile, Dillashaw went in there making... What did Dillashaw make for the fight? Like eighteen thousand and plus the win bonus, thirty-six times, and he uh, he had really he didn't have a lot to lose, so that, that's what happens. It kind of reminded me of a Vitor Belfort, and I don't want to you know knock these guys' educations, but emotionally you're dealing with a a grown man with a uh, you know maybe a sixth grade emotional and uh, or maybe a sixth grade education period. 
Well, you know, going into it, and I heard, I heard grumblings. You brought it up, and I heard grumblings elsewhere that just watch, uh, watch out for Brow. There's a lot of stuff going on. And even he said after the fight, there was a lot of distractions. What were the distractions? You know, that you felt as though you were getting ripped off. And, you know, not just so much the fight, Joey, but clearly it affected his camp going into the fight, as he wasn't in the same shape that he normally is in. No question. I mean, fighting is so much mental that, you know, people don't realize that. I mean, I'd rather have a guy go out there, you know, I'd rather take a an underdog against a guy who just broke up with his girlfriend than a guy that's got a, a sprained ankle. You know what I mean? I mean, emotional maturity. You just have to put that all out of your head. Floyd Mayweather is the greatest example in boxing. Most dysfunctional guy outside the ring, second he steps in those ropes, what he does is, is art. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it was real art uh, at Fatburger the other night, uh, Joey. We played the video earlier. He's got to watch out, man. Guys like T.I. Uh, start popping caps in Fatburger, and uh, Floyd Mayweather ain't fighting at the MGM anytime soon. Yeah, I didn't catch the video. I'll have to check it out. So, uh, Joey, uh, uh, Joey's a big uh, Floyd Mayweather uh, fan. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. In and out of the ring, because he balances it so well. He does so, makes some of the errors outside the ropes, but when he steps inside the ropes, it's just like he becomes another man, makes adjustments to anything. I mean, this guy, he could break out of Alcatraz if, if, if the ring was a jail. Yeah, no, you're right. He's, he's, he's a genius in the ring. He's one of the smartest guys in the ring, and he makes a lot of money, but his decisions outside the ring are anything but genius. Like, and you're talking about Hen and Burrow not uh, being the sharpest uh, dude, but, but anyway, that, that's besides the point. Um... Robbie Lawler, uh, Joey. Robbie Lawler was like a minus 225 favorite. That was my best bet of the week uh, last week. I was telling anyone that would listen, I don't understand this number. I think Robbie Lawler should be a bigger favorite. But the money was steaming in on Ellenberger, and I got a bad number, man. I ended up betting it at minus 188. And Robbie Lawler closed at minus 160, Joey, and he was every bit as dominant as I thought he was going to be. The question is, is he pushing the envelope a little bit too much now by fighting Matt Brown in July, July 26th? So he fought March 15th. He fought uh, just the other night. And now he's going to be fighting again in July. That's three fights in five months, Joey. That's, that, is this is going to catch up to him? You know, I thought it might have caught up to him after the war with Hendricks. I mean, five rounds, he didn't know how he was going to bounce back from that, especially in defeat, but he handled it well. He's getting paid well. So his, his mental state of mind, I mean, there's emotional maturity. A guy who's been around forever, back in two, the early 2000s, you know, remember his fight with Nate Diaz, or uh, Nick Diaz, rather. I mean, Robbie Lowe has been around a long time. He's a mature veteran. You know, you, you see the second coming of these guys. Vitor Belfort, same thing. Emotional maturity. And when these guys get to that point where they can leave the nonsense outside the ring and step in the ring and get their stuff done, I mean, a guy like, you know, I, I don't want to say a guy like Overeem by now, you would think that he would be, you know, over the hump and in a good place. But, you know, just to use him as an example, where he's, he's going on the decline now. You know, he had his, his, little, his little peak, and now all of a sudden, uh, you know, he's not, uh, he's not even relevant. Uh, Joey Odessa with us. All right, Joey. So uh, quickly, before we take a quick break, then we'll come back and uh, we'll jump in. As far as Musasi and uh, Munoz is concerned, Carmel, Dalloway, and all those other fights, there's actually two cards on Saturday, Brazil and Germany. The Brazilian card is the ultimate fighter show, so we still have some work to do. We'll dive in later in the week and see if we can find any hidden gems uh, in the prelims. But uh, unfortunately, the main event, not Dos Santos anymore. Your favorite fighter, Malinado, comes in, Joey, is the late replacement. I know you don't think very highly of Malinado, but the guy's freaking tough, and you got to give him credit, man. He'll fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. Well, he beat our guy, uh, Jan Valente, who's cost us money so many times in the past that it, every time I say Hofstra, I think of uh, Weidman and I think of Valente, and unfortunately, it kind of zeroes each other out because one's doing great and one just costs us every time. Um, I tell you what, I'm not I'm not a big Stipe fan. He's 11 and one, but you know somebody that you said was going to be a UFC champ one day who still has a possibility, Stefan Struve. He uh, you know Struve KO'd him, and despite him beating Roy Nelson, I think he beat Roy Roy at a bad night. He did beat Gonzaga, but he went to decision with him. And you know people wrote Gonzaga off for dead a long time ago. And you know I'm talking about Stipe now, and Fabio. 
Fabio, you know, he racked up three straight against, uh, I don't think, too good of opposition. I mean, prior to that, they threw him uh, Glover to Shara, and uh, Glover stopped him. But, you know, he beat Jan, he beat uh, Joey Beltran, and uh, who actually, I, if I'm not mistaken, Beltran, he, he just fought Jackson, right? Yeah. Lost to Rampage Jackson, so it's not, he doesn't have the greatest resume, but he's got a bit of a beard on him. He's only been knocked out once, and uh, it's, what, 27 fights? He's been stopped, and, and Stipe. Cleveland State wrestler. He's got some all right hands, but at the same time, I think that we're looking at a guy that's he's been matched. He's been matched fairly well. I mean, he beat Beltran, the same thing. He beat him by decision. Um, you know, Shane Del Rosario, you know, rest in peace, Philip DeFreeze. I mean, Seth doesn't really have anybody on his resume that impresses me, and he was not a big standout wrestler at uh, Cleveland State either. I mean, I think he got beat in the first or second round of the tournament. Uh, the, uh, NCAA tournament. I, I've said this in the past, and now he's counting on his boxing and stuff. And I mean, it's a fight he's supposed to win. I saw him as high as a six to one favorite, which I think is absurd in Brazil because, you know, just like Henderson closing in the end, and just like Waller, well, you'll get the same. You know, as a as a bookmaker or a sports book, you get the same bet on Dan Henderson at plus four fifty as you will at plus eight hundred. Now it just depends on whether you want to be taking huge risk and you know not managing it your sport book well, and the same thing with uh, Burrell. I mean, Burrell deserved to be a bigger favorite because of the, the publicity and the pumping they were putting behind him, but uh, it put so much pressure on him that, you know, Dillasso, you know, and it's easy to say in hindsight, Dillasso was like a, a no-brainer, whereas a guy like Henderson, the same, same kind of odds ballpark for Cormier, and, uh, you know, I, kind, I didn't feel bad for Henderson because Hendo's made a lot of money. He's a good businessman, fights all the time. But uh, he, he pretty much got ragged out by Cormier. Yeah, he got, uh, we're, he, we're, he got he got tossed around. We got to take a break, Joe. But he got uh, tossed around. With Myosik, he, he should win the fight. Uh, but as you mentioned, uh, maldonado has got a great beard. He's shown he can take a shot. He's also shown he can throw them. Uh, I think that it's going to be it's going to be an entertaining stand-up war. But there's no way in hell I'm laying minus 500. We've seen three weeks in a row in the UFC and uh, one in Bellator actually. Huge underdogs are getting there on a weekly basis. It's been uh, the dog days of summer arriving early in the world of uh, mixed martial arts. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and uh, we'll take a look at this card in Germany. Musasi and Munoz is the main event. MMA Meltdown continues. MMA Meltdown on the Fight Network continues. I am Gabriel Morenci. Uh, we're in conversation with the premier combat sport odds maker in the business, boxing, mixed martial arts, and even wrestling, Joey Odessa, joining us from Costa Rica. So, uh, Joey, uh, we got Gegar Mousasi and uh, Mark Munoz. You know, it was only a couple of years ago that Mark Munoz was uh, heavily hyped and you know, was deemed almost as unstoppable, another Oklahoma State uh, guy, uh, yet... You know, a couple of beatings later, and uh, he finds himself as a, as a uh, you know, plus 300 underdog. Musashi's a three-to-one favorite, Joey. I tell you what, uh, Mark Munoz, just the simple fact that he's back in the octagon. I mean, he put on so much weight and had a lot of real, uh, I guess, you know, I don't know what, it, what exactly the problems were, but the fact that he did come back and, you know, he won against Tim Bose and, uh, you know, he did get knocked out by Machida. You know, I've never been a Musashi fan. I, I I felt that he's beatable. Um, you know, I got years ago. It's got to be four years ago. You know, I don't want to bring up King Mo, but King Mo beat him and held him down. And I tell you what, uh, Mark Munoz, if he doesn't shoot, you know, he's always had a problem from. I don't want to coach Joe, but he's always had a problem from shooting too far out when his cardio wasn't there. But I mean, he came back from such from almost being obese to where he is now. I mean, that in itself, and and he's one of the most. Uh, I believe he might be one of the most academically decorated uh, fighters in the UFC. I mean, you're talking about a guy that's going to give an honest fight, and you look at this fight and you'll say, wow, Masasi, you know, he's got 18 KOs and this and that, but they're not from head kicks, and, and it seems that uh, that every time Munoz gets knocked out, it's with a head kick. I mean, uh, Matt Hamill knocked him out with a head kick. Um, Okami he split with, there's no shame there. Wide, well, Weidman was a, a KO by uh, elbows, but... Uh, Machida was also a head kick, so we don't know how it bounced back. But I tell you what, I'm not looking to uh, lay a big number on Masashi. I think the number's probably 
a little high. I mean, I think he should be about a two-to-one favorite, Musasi. You know, it'll go, it'll go up. People will pump him up, and you know. But at the same time, these early numbers are just not accurate. I mean, you're going to watch some of these favorites flip. I see it already. I, you know, with uh, with this card in Germany. I mean, Hein and Dauber. I mean, there's there's about on the undercard. I'm not trying to throw you any fastballs here, but it's a, uh, about on the undercard that you know Hein is a better fighter, and he's at home. You know, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be you know one of those things where you know the trends. Everybody jumps on these underdog trends and. You know, you'll see it. You'll see it on Twitter. You'll see it on all, you know, this, this is where the stack guys love it. Cause it gives them something to talk about. They'll start comparing events, and they, they just don't understand it. No two fights are the same. This is not the NFL. This is not, you know, you know, passers versus rushers and, and first downs and, you know, time you know time between plays and, you know, we're going to run the ball so many times. That's not how this works. These are entirely different people from entirely different continents, and you have travel and everything else mixed in. In fact, Dana White even said the travel to the Philippines and another country has been a problem for a lot of these guys. Yeah, the time zone uh, difference, uh, six hours ahead uh, in Europe uh, here. Francis, uh, Francis Carmel, uh, you know, they're not, uh, you know, Carmel, man. They're, he's racking up the frequent flyer miles. They made him fight uh, Jacare in Brazil. He lost. Uh, he actually looked pretty good, though, in that fight. Uh, Jacare struggled at times. Uh, but he, he willed himself to victory. So we got Francis Carma, buck 60 favorite against C.B. Dalloway, who, you know, Dalloway, one of these flashy TV guys earlier, maybe, you know, wasn't taking it as seriously as he should have been, but you're always talking about the mental maturity, uh, Joey, of fighters, and looks like C.B. Dalloway sort of found that. Instead of just being a partier, you know, he's, he decided that he wants to win fights, and you know, he's been winning fights. I thought he got robbed against Tim Boach. I thought he legitimately won that fight. And here he is, an underdog against uh, Francis Carmont. This is an interesting fight uh, here. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, Carmont's, what, Carmont's got 30 fights, and he's lost eight times. So it's not like he's going out there unbeatable. And I agree with you about the Boach fight with Dalloway. I mean, Dalloway arguably could be uh, 4-0 and going back to 2011. I mean, that's where, you know, he started having some problems. He lost to, he lost to the headliner, uh, Mark Munoz. You know what I mean? So, and he lost to Jared Hammond too. So, but I tell you what, uh, Dalloway's wrestling is good enough to beat Carmont if he grinds it out. But at the same time, you got to look at these judges. I mean, how many times have we seen? And that's a giant elephant in the room. I mean, it's tough to with, with these style matchups sometimes to pull the trigger early on some of these fighters because if they stand them up, you know, and and, and the fence grabs. I mean, phew, you just don't know what to expect. I see some referees out there that just like I. Fights get decided by grabbing shorts, you know, huge. I, I'll tell you right now, again, and, and not to jump so far ahead, but Alpha Male with Chad Mendes is going to have another UFC champ. It's going to happen. It should have happened the first time. He had him. He had him, and he grabbed the fence. I, I, I really believe that, and I think Mendes is going to be ready and flying off the momentum, but not to get off topic. Go ahead. I think C.B. Dalloway is capable of winning this fight. Uh, Luke Barnett, uh, one of the British fighters, Joey, they're always trying to hype up the, the European fighters make them out to be better than they actually are. Um, you know, we see this with Conor McGregor right now, in which, you know, according to Dana White, Conor McGregor's like the second or third biggest star uh, in the UFC. And it's funny, he said, you know, you can't go into a sports bar in Boston or an Irish pub in Boston without seeing a poster of Conor McGregor. And I'm thinking to myself, it's because you freaking sent them the posters, Dana. That's why they have the posters. They never heard of Conor McGregor before. But, you know, they try to market and they make, and they do, they do a good job. They can make stars out of guys that aren't really stars because of where they're from. And I thought maybe they were doing this with Luke Barnett, but I look at this guy and how he just destroys people, uh, Joey. And I'm starting to buy into Barnett a little bit here, but Sean Strickland can fight. This isn't, a, this isn't a gimme free pass for Barnett here, even though I'm sure people in Europe think it is. He's a minus 200 favorite, but... It's a tough fight. I still am leading with Barnett here, but yeah, something dangerous about this fight. You know, right now I see him at, uh, I see 225s out there, 200s. You know, I wrote down originally that I thought Barnett should be the favorite, dollar fifty, maybe tops, against Strickland, who was the king of the cage guy. But, you know, you look at the quality of opposition, it, it's really tough. I think it's a tough bout. I think Sean Strickland's got a real good shot of winning this fight. And uh, one one thing about him, I mean, this kid can punch. You know, he's seven of his wins by knockout. I I'm uh, I, I kind of like Strickland here. 
Especially, I mean, forget about the number. I mean, if you had to, if I have to pick a winner, I'm picking Strickland. But what about the travel, Joey? Uh, something that you believe in and I believe in as well. You know, this this fight's not in America, right? It's it's not in England, but it's in Germany and it's in Europe, basically. So, you know, the the European guys are fighting on at least their own time zones, and they're more comfortable um, than than the American guys going over there. Yeah, I mean, you got two undefeated guys going at it right here. Uh, you know, it's not about I'm running out to bet double fist. It's, it's just not one that, uh, I mean, if I had to bet it, I'd bet Strickland. All right, uh, Joey. So uh, we got a couple of fight announcements, actually, that were made. Uh, so uh, Matt Brown and Robbie Lawler. And, uh, man, and I was thinking the other night when I was watching Robbie Lawler, it actually crossed my mind. I'm like, man, Lawler and Matt Brown would just be the sickest fight, like, ever, almost. And... Well, the UFC is giving the fans what they want uh, with this one. Matt Brown and Robbie Lawler going to be uh, fighting July the 26th, uh, Fox 12. And we got uh, Jones and Gustafson lined up for August 30th. Yet, this is interesting, Joey. The UFC announces that Gustafson has signed a contract for the fight. But John Jones isn't under contract. John Jones has to renegotiate his deal with the UFC right now. And it's funny because the UFC kind of puts Jones in a situation where Dana doesn't like Jones, obviously. He likes him, but there's some bad blood there. So they're putting, they're painting Jones in a corner. Hey, Gustafson already signed a contract. What are you waiting for? But then conversely, I'm thinking, now Jones has some pretty good leverage to get paid, Joey. Yeah, I mean, he's not going to dump the belt in the trash or anything like that because there's no other organization out there that is going to pay him what the UFC is going to pay him, even if he doesn't get what he thinks he deserves. Um, but I tell you what, he's going to beat Gustafsson. I, you know, I'm one of those people that thinks the first Gustafsson fight was a fluke, and uh, I still think it was. I think Jones is going to beat him again. And I think Daniel Cormier is going to come out of the woods, and uh, I think he's going to beat John Jones. I think he's going to show people the difference between a junior national caliber Greco-Roman wrestler who had great potential, who was a junior college champ against an Olympian, who has a chin, who's training with bigger guys, who might not look like, you know, the, the most dynamic fighter on the planet. Um, I think Daniel Cormier is going to take him down, and I think he's going to, uh, I think he can stand with him too. I tell you what, I think, I think Jones is going to be in some trouble. He might want to renegotiate a, a good contract. You know, Joey, I agree with you. I think that Daniel Cormier is the future champion here. I don't want to sell Gustafson short because I don't think that first fight was a fluke. But I think that Jones will survive the rematch. Uh, but, yeah, my money's going to be on Cormier. And we only got a minute left here, Joey. But and I know you hate the fictitious numbers of fights that aren't out there yet. But there's a number out there. Cormier Jones. John Jones minus a buck seventy Against Cormier. I mean, how can you not like Daniel Cormier? I mean, you, how can you just... I, but people will gonna... say, Joey, people will say, how the hell do you not take John Jones at that low price? You know, the same people that say that are the same guys that, that bet against him when he fought, I guess it was Galvai, when nobody knew who he was. And he came out of no, you know, when he came out of nowhere with his, with his credentials. John Jones is a very good fighter, very skilled fighter, smart fighter. But Daniel Cormier is also a two-time Olympic team member. And uh, there's a big, you know, there's a big, well, there's a big difference between Daniel Cormier and John Jones in the wrestling department. John Jones is a little bit more wiry. You know, if we want to call him more athletic, we can call him more athletic. But Dan's down to the weight now. And Dan just made Dan Henderson. Dan Cormier just made Dan Henderson look like, I don't even know, like Hornswoggle from WWE. I mean, he threw him around. He, I don't want to say embarrass him because Hendo is always dangerous, and I have a lot of respect for him as a wrestler. And as a fighter, he'll fight anybody on any given day. But Daniel Cormier went out there and abused him like I've never, you know, like I've never seen him yeah, abused. Just, he just controlled him, uh, you know, he manhandled him uh, without a doubt. Uh, Joey Odessa, follow him on Twitter at MMA Odds. You can also catch uh, Joey uh, and me, Sirius XM, Channel 167, MMA Meltdown Radio. That's uh, Tuesday nights at 10 o'clock Eastern, and we follow Corey Erdman. Uh, with Boxing uh, Weekly, talking the the sweet sides at 9 o'clock. Joey, it's always a pleasure. We'll catch you on the radio.
Okay, my pleasure, G. Have a good night. There's Joey Odessa with us. Great stuff, as always, uh, from Costa Rica, crunching the numbers. And it's interesting that we hear that. John Jones, minus 170 against Daniel Cormier. Although this fight's a little ways away, he's got to get past uh, Gufson first. But I think the Cormier would beat John Jones. MMA meltdown continues. Our backs against the wall uh, here. We're coming off a great week of picks last week. If you check out SportsRageTV.com on fight days, we post all of our picks, totals, over-unders, parlays, and everything else in between. We kicked some serious ass, but unfortunately we got drilled in the counter move tournament. So congratulations to everybody that uh, beat me. It wasn't all that uh, hard to do this past week, and it's amazing. I was in like seven counter move tournaments. My worst score was the one that uh, the Morenci beat the Morenci Bounty <laughs> tournament. So I got drilled in counter move, but I won real money. I got to figure out how to win in the fantasy and the real world together at once. Thanks to uh, Vince Pichel for joining us. Thanks to Joey Odessa for joining us. So well, shout out to everybody here at the Fight Network. Other than that, you're on your own. Later. Later.